Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday series where I give you a recap of all things Starship development, launch events from the past week, and all the other coolest stories from the world of spaceflight. These past seven days have certainly been crazy. From the first full stack of Ship 24 and Booster 7, seven orbital launches from sites around the world, International Space Station updates, Ariane 6 stacking, NASA's DART mission updates, and more. Let's kick things off, beginning, as always, with Starship News. The biggest thing I talked about in last Monday's episode of Space This Week was the fifth rollout of Booster 7, and this week the story continues. The booster was stacked onto the orbital launch mount using the Mechazilla arms. Not long after, Ship 24 was stacked above it, following a short delay after the bump pads, designed to protect the TPS tiles on the ship, were slightly too thick and the arms couldn't grab the ship properly. This was fixed, and yeah, the lift went well, completing the first ever full stack of Ship 24 and Booster 7. The last time we saw a full stack of the Super Heavy Starship system was at the beginning of the year, with Booster 4 and Ship 20, which of course have since been retired. Here's hoping that this isn't the end of Booster 7 and Ship 24 as well, and the current plan of a full 33-engine static fire test with the booster and vehicle fully stacked together will continue as promised. And then I guess the eventual orbital flight test. We've also started seeing stacking work for Ship 26. This is, of course, the interesting Starship prototype, as it, along with Ship 27, appear to be lacking any control flaps or re-entry shielding, or in other words, they will be fully expendable vehicles. They're likely going to serve as a stepping stone to support early test flights, where SpaceX's primary focus will be on the Super Heavy first stage. Indeed, Ship 28 is looking like it'll be back to the same style as Ship 24 and Ship 25, as in fully recoverable, as we've started seeing components for this ship sporting heat shield tiles once again. All of this is very speculative, of course, but I'd love to hear your theories down below in the comments section. And hey, while you are down there, I gotta shamelessly ask that if you are enjoying the video so far, then don't forget to leave a little like down below to help support what I do here. I always very much appreciate it. And hey, subscribe if you're enjoying it too, because you get these videos every Monday, so you always stay in the loop about space news. Now, there I was on Sunday, all ready to publish this video to Patreon and channel members who get these videos a day early, but then SpaceX had to go and throw a spanner in the works by destacking Ship 24. Ah, we don't know the exact problems here, if there were any problems at all that is, but there's a growing suspicion that there may be an issue with the connection points between Ship 24 and Booster 7. Now, Ship 24 was temporarily unmated from the booster on Wednesday, but workers appeared to achieve something and then the ship was reseated. So why now a full D-stack? Was whatever the workers did here insufficient? Or maybe there was an issue with the quick disconnect system? After all, we did see temporary scaffolding placed on the quick disconnect arm around the ship's interface panel during the stack. What do you think's happened here? I'm really curious to hear what your thoughts are, but yeah. We all await answers with bated breath. I mean, by the time you guys are watching this, there's a chance that Booster 7 has been destacked as well. So the next few days are certainly going to be interesting ones to watch. Our team in the skies, Greg and Fariel, conducted another flyover at Starbase Roberts Road at the Kennedy Space Center last week, and things have certainly continued to grow since their last flyover. We can see that at the Starbase and Hangar X site, the Star Factory building continues to sprawl out, and we can see that the concrete flooring is going down, and more and more pieces of what will eventually become the new Mega Bay are springing up around the Mega Bay foundations, surrounding one of the two cranes that SpaceX will be using to construct the new Starbase. We can also see in the background that Hangar X is now sporting a brand new parking lot, so Hangar X looks like it's ready to enter full operational service, if it hasn't already. Hangar X, for now at least, will be used to support Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy vehicles. We can also see that, just behind the two cranes here, two new Starship launch tower segments have appeared. We're still not entirely sure where these will go, the current speculation is that they could be heading for Launch Complex 40 for a brand new third Starship launch pad. Some have speculated that this tower will actually only be for Falcon 9. However, you can see this little notch at the bottom of this segment here. This is the stopper piece that the giant Starship catch and stacking arms will rest on when at their lowest position, which pretty much confirms that this tower will be for Starship and will sport its very own Mechazilla. Speaking of Mechazilla, we can see that the catch arms for the Pad 39A tower are still sat in the build yard at Starbase. However, down at the pad, we can see crews begin erecting the assembly scaffolding that'll be used to install the arms on the recently completed tower. We saw a similar structure when the arms at Boca Chica were first installed. 
We can also see that the Falcon 9 pad's transporter erector is in a supine position, with crews working around it. That's because it's being prepared for a very special Falcon launch, the FH-004 mission. FH standing for Falcon Heavy. Yes, this will be the first time that we've seen a Falcon Heavy launch in over three years. And to think, the test flight still only feels like yesterday. This is currently slated to take place no earlier than the 31st of October, and it's definitely one to be hyped about. The double landing zone touchdowns for the two Falcon 9 side boosters are always something really special to watch. Unfortunately, in order to maximize the payloads to orbit for this mission, the central stage won't have enough fuel to attempt its own landing, and so instead it'll just crash straight into the ocean shortly after stage separation, which, in a dark way, is still pretty much par for the course for the Falcon Heavy. <laughs> now while on the subject of Falcon, last week I talked about the amazing Falcon 9 Intelsat G33 G34 mission, which saw a Falcon 9 place two satellites, the aforementioned Intelsat G33 and G34 satellites, to geosynchronous Earth orbit. What was special about this particular launch was the amazing live stream we got. We got amazing views of fairing separation, the two big white blobs to the left of the screen there, and the star shot of the show, which was the camera on the deck of the drone ship. And thanks to popular demand, SpaceX have released a full uncut video from this view, which captured the entire launch, and of course, that iconic giant space jellyfish, a phenomenon created by sunlight reflecting off the plume of the rocket's exhaust. All of this, and of course, the booster touchdown itself, meaning that this video basically contains the entire flight of this booster. And look, the plume is still visible in the background of this landing shot. I think the only way SpaceX are going to top this will be if they follow Scott Manley's suggestion of launching a booster in parallel with the Starlink launch to provide third-person viewpoints of the launch and landing. Come on, SpaceX, make it happen. Now moving on to completely unedited and politically neutral footage, last Monday we saw a Soyuz 2.1B launch from the Plesetska launch site, carrying a single GLONASS satellite, the GLONASS network of course being basically the Russian version of GPS, to medium Earth orbit. It goes without saying that the launch was a success, it's a Soyuz rocket after all, and the satellite is now operational. Less can be said about the success of the next launch we saw last week. On the 12th of October, Japan launched their Epsilon-6 mission, which saw the Epsilon rocket carry eight payloads, including the Innovative Satellite Technology Demonstration 3 mission, to orbit. Unfortunately, seven minutes after launch, Mission Control sent the destroy command to the rocket due to the fact that at the separation of the second stage, the rocket had sub-nominal attitude and wouldn't be able to reach orbit. It's now time for more politically neutral and unedited footage to discuss now. And by the way, if this segment of the video is all blurred, it's because I had a copyright claim filed against this segment from Roscosmos. Anyway, on the 12th of October, we saw a Proton-M launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, carrying a single Angosat-2 to geosynchronous Earth orbit. This is a communication satellite that was launched to replace the Angosat-1, which unfortunately failed shortly after launch back in 2017. Also on the 12th of October, China launched a Long March 2C rocket, which was carrying a single satellite on behalf of the Ministry of Emergency Management. This was an Earth observation payload, the SSAR-01 satellite, which is the fourth of the Huanjing line of satellites, which are designed for disaster and environmental monitoring. Two days later, on the 14th of October, China launched something else, this time one of their trusty Long March 2Ds. This carried another batch of Yaogan reconnaissance satellites to low Earth orbit. China continued to maintain that these satellites are to be mainly used in scientific experiments, land and resource surveys, agricultural production estimates, and disaster prevention, though the Yaogan satellites are widely understood to be primarily for military reconnaissance, being bankrolled by the Chinese military and all that. <laughs> now back to SpaceX stuff now. On the 15th of October, SpaceX launched another trusty Falcon 9 from Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Base, launching the Hotbird 13F satellite to geostationary Earth orbit. This was the third overall launch for this booster, 1069, and hopefully it won't be the last as it successfully managed to touch down on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions shortly after second stage separation. The Hotbird 13F satellite, along with its sister satellite, the Hotbird 13G, is a 4.5 metric ton communication satellite designed to provide up to a thousand television channels to over 160 million homes in Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. We have another piece of unedited and politically neutral piece of launch footage from Russia. An Angara 1.2 launch vehicle deployed a single technology demonstration satellite to low Earth orbit on the 15th of October. Not a lot else is really known about the satellite, but hey, the rocket is a cool one. This launch was only the second ever Angara 1.2 flight. 
In fact, the footage on screen is of the first Angara 1.2 launch, since there's currently no publicly available launch video of last week's launch. Last week, I discussed the Crew-5 launch. Well, now that they're all settled aboard the International Space Station, Crew-4 can return home. And that's what they did. On the 14th of October, SpaceX's Freedom Crew Dragon spacecraft with NASA astronauts Chell Lindgren, Robert Hines, and Jessica Watkins, and ESA astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti, closed its hatch to the station and autonomously undocked and departed the station's Harmony module before re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down in the ocean just off the coast of Florida a few hours later bringing a close to SpaceX's fourth operational Crew Dragon mission for NASA's commercial crew program. Two weeks ago, I covered the successful impact of NASA's DART mission. After 10 months in space, NASA's double asteroid redirection test, better known as the DART mission, successfully impacted its asteroid target last Monday, smashing into the asteroid Dimorphos. This was the world's first ever planetary defense technology demonstration mission, and the objective here was to see if crashing a spacecraft into an asteroid would be a viable way to redirect its course in the event of an asteroid or comet on a collision course with Earth were to ever be discovered. Now, to be clear, asteroid Dimorphos was not on a collision course with Earth, so there's no need to panic, and now the results are in. The initial results of the DART mission show that the orbit of the asteroid was, in fact, altered around asteroid Didymos, thereby altering the orbit of the binary asteroid system around the Sun. And don't worry, it's still not on an Earth collision course trajectory. So, so this is a huge win for the DART team. And of course, humanity. We're officially one step closer to preserving life as we know it in the event of a world-ending asteroid or comet being discovered. Spaceport Cornwall has received its first ever rocket. Cornwall is in the UK, which of course is where I herald from, and we're soon going to be launching our first ever orbital rocket launch. This will be achieved with Virgin Orbit's air-launched Launcher 1 vehicle, currently slated to launch no earlier than the 29th of October. Now, do note that when I say this will be the UK's first orbital launch, I mean launch from our own soil. Uh, ish. <laughs> we used to have the short-lived Black Arrow program. However, this rocket was launched from Australia. See, you can tell. Here's a picture of the launch. There's no visible exhaust plume here because, of course, Australia is upside down. So all the teams had to do was release the rocket's ground harness and gravity did all the work. Space This Week is a serious show where we discuss serious news. Please, st everyone, stop clicking away. It's fine. <laughs> anyway, check this out. Ariane Space released this video of their brand new flagship launch vehicle, the Ariane 6, being stacked in the French Guiana for the very first time. This is actually a test model of the Ariane 6's central core, which consists of the main core of the rocket flanked by four solid rocket motors, the exact same solid rocket motors that power the new, smaller Vega C launch vehicle. When ready, the Ariane 6 will be available in either a 2 or 4 SRB variant, and it's expected to make its maiden flight at some point in 2023. Good luck to the teams at Ariane Space. Guys, Tori Bruno has an engine. Yes! United Launch Alliance boss Tori Bruno tweeted this shot of the first BE-4 engine, which will power the first stage of the upcoming Vulcan rocket, being uncrated at the United Launch Alliance rocket factory. Wait a second, that's a... That's an interesting typo. I'm pretty sure Tori meant to say uncreated instead of uncreated, though you know what this means. If the first Vulcan launch ends in a failure, uncreated is definitely going to be United Launch Alliance's version of rapid unplanned disassembly. Hopefully everything will go well with the first launch though, and this isn't some dark foreshadowing or anything. Fun fact, this particular photo has a banana for scale. Can you find it? There's definitely one there. When you find it, let me know in the comments down below. And if you do give up, I'll put the answer in the video description. But, you know, give it some time. It's a fun little challenge, and yeah. <laughs> I must now give a huge thanks to the list of names on screen. They're my Patreon supporters and channel members, and it's their generous support that allows me to make these videos for you all. If you want to join their ranks, then you guys know how. Otherwise, there are two video suggestions on screen from my channel that YouTube thinks you'll like. Hopefully the good picks, and hopefully you enjoyed this video. And that's the end. Still don't have an outro. Fly safe. Don't think that one's taken, right?